This video is brought to you by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. What's up, everybody? Good evening. Hope you guys are doing well. A little bit later than usual for a video, but the Seattle Seahawks just released something pretty significant here. And we got to spend some time pulling it apart, taking a look at it, putting it back together, and trying to understand what we're looking at. The Seattle Seahawks just released their first depth chart of the 2024 season. It's an unofficial depth chart, obviously. I mean, we haven't even played preseason games yet. How could they possibly know what their depth chart is actually going to look like? But this is likely a snapshot of where the Seahawks see things as of this moment. So it's certainly educational. It's certainly illuminating. It gives an idea of who they like the most on their team right now. And obviously, we still have a month plus for that to change. We have three preseason games. And then we have basically the regular season in five weeks. But there is still something to be learned from this list. So we're going to be going through what they've posted up here, trying to get an understanding, trying to get a feeling for what the Seahawks are seeing so far. But before we get into that, I want to tell you about my friends over at the BetUS Online Sportsbook and Casino. So maybe you're looking at this depth chart and you're thinking to yourself, I like this team. I think this team is going to be good. I think this team is going to overachieve and do better than people expect. I even think this team might win the division. I think this Seahawks depth chart is good enough to win the NFC West. And then you start thinking, hey, maybe I want to make a wager on that. Maybe I want to bet on it. Maybe I feel so confident that I'm willing to put money on it. Well, if you do, then I recommend you head over to BetUS.com and check out their many, many different ways in which you could take advantage of a feeling like that. Right now, you can go and get plus 700 on the Seattle Seahawks to win the NFC West for the upcoming season. That, that sounds like a pretty good investment to me. And if it sounds like a good investment to you, head on over to BetUS and throw down the wager. They might be the answer if the question is, where do you want to place your bets this year? They boast the fastest payouts in the industry, 125% sign-up bonus up to $2,000 on your first three deposits. There's a 200% crypto deposit bonus, fast and easy deposit and withdrawal process, 24-7 personalized service all 365 days of the year, live wagering on all major games, best betting variety in the business. You get 10% back on your net losses twice a year. And BetUS will even give you your very own personal account manager. If you want to know more, use the link down in the description or in the pinned comment to look up more about BetUS. Give them a look, give them a shot, and get to some betting. All right, so let's take a look at this depth chart here. Let's try to get a feel for this. So let's just kind of go in order here of the uh, traditional ordering of positions in the NFL. Quarterback goes Geno Smith, Sam Howell, P.J. Walker. Nothing surprising there. Pretty much exactly what any sane person would have expected going into the season. I know some people thought Walker might uh, jump over Howell, but um, that that's obviously not happening. And I don't think it should happen. Howell has NFL experience. I'm not scared of him having to play in a game if he needs to. So that's as expected. And then they go running back. We got Ken Walker up front. Then you've got Charbonnet. And then you've got Kenny McIntosh behind him. Now, I don't know if going from side to side and then going down is the right way to read this, but I'm thinking that's probably the way in which this is meant to be processed. So it seems to me we're going K9, then Charbonnet, then McIntosh, and then you go down to the next line vertically and get to George Halani. So George Halani is your fourth string running back. And then you've got Kobe Lewis and Curry Robinson. So if that is the case, then the running back room is going as I expected. I expect Halani to ultimately be the fourth running back. And Kobe and Curry, I don't think, will make the team or may make the practice squad. They split up wide receiver into three different um, sections, which I actually like. So wide receiver, we go DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, JSN at the top. We all know that. And then on the next um, column, we go Jake Bobo. We, and then we got Dariq Young. And then you've got uh, Shenault Jr. At least, I think that's how we're meant to process this data here. I think it goes Metcalf, Lockett, JSN, and then Bobo, Young, Shenault Jr. I think. 
So if that's the case, those are your six receivers. And then everybody else is probably not going to be able to be fit on the roster because you can only really fit six receivers on the roster unless you're doing something very creative and interesting and different. And I don't think we're going to be doing that because we do actually have a decent investment into our tight ends. But once you get past that group, you've got Cody White, who has been looking really good in training camp so far, Hayden Hatton, Ty Scott, you've got Aesop Winston Jr., you've got Marcus Sims, and then you've got D. Eskridge. If I was to try to put it in order, not that I really think it matters because I think everybody I just listed is probably not making the team as of right now, it would probably go something like Eskridge, White, Hatton, Scott, Aesop Winston Jr., Marcus Sims, something like that. Again, those are the guys who there's probably no room for, but at the end of the day, what matters is the top six, because those are the guys who actually make the team, and I think this lays out a pretty reasonable right now top six. Tight end, we've got Noah Fant, followed by Farrell Brown, and then Tyler Mabry. That's an interesting choice with the Mabry pick, if that is indeed the order we're supposed to be taking this. And I think that it is. And then after Mabry, we have Brady Russell, and then A.J. Barner, and then Jack Westover. So if that is the way this data is meant to be understood, then I guess it's not terribly surprising that the two rookies are at the back of the line. But the fact that they're not over Mabry, who has been a lifelong practice squatter, and Brady Russell, a guy who basically wasn't able to even get on the field at all last year, unless we had a complete emergency, well, it's, uh, I mean, it's at least notable, right? I'm not too worried about it. Once you get this far down your tight end depth chart, it doesn't really matter that much. But I would say that over the next month, A.J. Barner should make a push for tight end three. If he can't push Russell and Mabry out of the way in the next month, I'd be a little bit surprised. So that is tight end. Now we go over to the offensive line here, starting with the left tackle, Charles Cross starting, Raekwon O'Neal currently listed as the backup, which is kind of interesting. It's not Stone Forsyth like I would expect. Forsyth will come up a little bit later in this video. And then the guys who probably won't have room on the team would be Max Percher and Garrett Greenfield. So nothing too radically unexpected there, but they're going with O'Neal as the listed backup left tackle over uh, Stone Forsyth, which... I don't know if that would actually happen in a game if it came to it, but it is certainly notable. Left guard goes Lakin Tomlinson, then McClendon Curtis, then Ilm Manning. Pretty predictable, pretty understandable. Seems about right. I will say that there was some anticipation that someone like Bradford or Haynes could slide over to left guard, even Lomia. But on this current chart, we don't see that yet. It could still happen. Right now, they go Tomlinson, Curtis, Manning, so Manning obviously won't make the team, but it sure seems like Curtis will because they like his flexibility. Uh, center, now we're waiting on the Connor Williams signing that I still kind of expect to happen at this point. But for now, we go Oluwatimi, then Harris. The supposed impression of these players out of camp so far is there isn't a lot separating them, and that's not really that good of a thing. Oluwatimi is not winning the job outright. It seems like they're letting Nick Harris show that he might be better or just as good as Oluwatimi, and neither guy is good enough to drive them off of Connor Williams. But that's the depth chart right now. For whatever it's worth, Olu is in the lead. Right guard, we go Anthony Bradford, Christian Haynes, and then Setaoa Lomia. So that's pretty strong. I do think that Haynes probably takes the starting spot over the next month, but for now, he is the backup. And I don't know what happens to Bradford at that point. Maybe he bumps over to the left side. Uh, right tackle, we got George Fant. Remember, Abe Lucas is currently injured. He's listed over here in parentheses to represent the fact that he's currently not playing. Obviously, he will start when he's healthy. Then you've got George Fant. Then you've got Stone Forsyth, Michael Jarrell, and Jalen Sundell. Now, Jalen Sundell, obviously massive uphill battle to make this team. Jarrell, I think we're going to try to squeeze him on, but we might also have to risk the practice squad. I don't know. It's possible that when Lucas comes back, Fant gets bumped to the backup and then Forsyth becomes the backup left tackle. I'm guessing that's why he's currently listed over here because they need a technical backup and they don't want it to be McClendon Curtis. But um, it, it's um, certainly notable that they've really come to view Forsyth as a viable right tackle when I've always viewed Forsyth, if anything, as a left tackle. So 
good for him for developing some flexibility for sure. All right, so that's the offense. That's everything going on on the offense. You can get a pretty good idea for who's likely to make the team, who's likely to not. So let's swing on over to the defense here. Let's take a look at their depth chart so far. And obviously things get a little bit murky here because we don't know exactly what the defense is going to look like. But based on what we have here, defensive tackle, we've got Leonard Williams as the number one. You've got Mike Morris behind him. And then you've got Miles Adams behind him with Rodney Matthews hanging out on the fringes. Now, Rodney Matthews would, you know, it, he'd have to walk on water to make the team probably. But Williams, Morris, Adams, that's within expectations. I don't know if Adams is going to make the team this year. I think that could go one way or the other. Nose tackle, Jonathan Hankins, Matt Gotell, Cam Young. And the interesting thing here, no Jaron Reed. Jaron Reed not listed as a nose tackle, which is what he played last year, listed as a defensive end. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how you're listed. It matters how you're used. But I do find this notable because Jaron Reed is an undersized nose tackle. He played well last year, but it's very possible. And I talked about this before. This coaching staff might think that he's just not capable of being a nose tackle in the Mike McDonald defense. So maybe they do bump him over. If that's the case, then Cameron Young, who is listed here as someone who is currently injured, um, it's kind of important that he gets back because I don't know if Gotell can really provide quality NFL reps right now. He might just be a permanent practice squad level guy. So Hankins and Young in a rotation is at least workable, and then we'll see what's up with Reed. But without Cam Young, Hankins is playing way too much, and we all know what happens when your defensive linemen play way too much. Defensive end is Jaron Reed and then Byron Murphy the second. And then we have two guys behind them, uh, Levelston and Pickering, that very unlikely they make the team. Maybe they can make the uh, practice squad, I guess. So, again, in line with expectations, I don't see any need to have Murphy play an excessive amount of football this year. We should definitely be taking it chill with him. He's very young, didn't have a ton of playing experience at Texas, if we're being honest. Um, the fact that we only go too deep at this position does make me wonder if a guy like... Uh, Miles Adams might be looked at as someone we want to keep because he can kind of play both roles. Maybe it makes me think we're going to end up picking somebody up. I'm not sure. We need to see what this defense ends up looking like. So uh, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here on this stuff, but it does seem to me that it gets a little bit thin over there, especially if Reed can't hold up, which he was a better as a nose tackle. He was. Okay, so now we get to the linebackers here. Rush linebacker, they actually have Draymond Jones listed at the top and Boye Mafe listed behind him. I don't think that's going to reflect what happens in the regular season, but it's very possible that this coaching staff sees something with Draymond Jones they really like. Now, we haven't been able to see it for a week because he's been hurt for a while now, but maybe they go Draymond Jones in a kind of utility role that he ends up playing a little bit more than Mafe because he's playing all over the place, whereas Mafe's playing kind of one defined role. After Mafe, we have Taylor. Then we have Nelson Cesar. Don't be shocked if those two flip. And then we still have Onu Giogu here, but obviously there's not going to be a lot of room for him. Um, and just to jump over to the other side of the linebacker room, uh, the, the Sam linebacker, I guess they call it, but it's another rush linebacker at the end of the day. Nwosu is listed at the top. Derek Hall is second. And then you have Sundiata Anderson. So makes plenty of sense. Lines up. Um, little bit of lack of clarity on the Jones versus Mafe listing, but again, that could easily flip in the next couple weeks, especially if Draymond doesn't practice. All right, inside linebacker, we got Dodson and Baker listed at one and two. Baker, by the way, missed practice again today. I'll say more about that later, but, um, he's still listed here. It doesn't seem like the injury's serious. Behind them right now, it goes Radigan, uh, Tyrese Knight, Pat O'Connell, Devin Richardson, Blake Lynch, who was just signed the other day, and then Drake Thomas, who is currently injured. So it gets very thin very quickly, because I don't think Tyrese Knight is ready to contribute at the NFL level very much. John Radigan is mostly a special teamer, and then after that, it becomes really kind of questionable. So it, it's not too bad at the top, but there is not a lot of depth here. Okay, so that just leaves the secondary now, the uh, uh, defensive secondary. We're going to start with the uh, cornerback spots. Let's just kind of go from left to right. We got Witherspoon, obviously, is one of the starting corners. And behind him is Trey Brown. And then you have Lance Boykin. Sure, makes sense. And then on the other cornerback spot, 
Uh, I'm sorry. And then after Boykin, you have Pritchett and you have D. Williams. I do expect Pritchett to jump Boykin because Pritchett's going to make the team and Boykin probably won't. But for now, Boykin takes the top spot. He has more experience and I haven't heard a ton about uh, Pritchett in training camp yet. So it makes sense. Um, on the other cornerback spot, you've got Reek Woolen and then you've got Mike Jackson. And then you have Artie Burns. And that makes a good amount of sense as well. Artie Burns is having a pretty good camp. Behind him, you have DJ James and then Carlton Johnson. Now, I still think that DJ James is going to jump Burns and be on the team when the season starts because we spent a pick on him and we like him and he's doing pretty good. And Burns, while he is a good veteran, I think just doesn't offer quite enough to stick around unless they do something else kind of exotic. Like maybe they carry less safeties than usual. Uh, maybe they only carry three middle linebackers or something. I'm not sure exactly what might shake out, but it seems to me that those spots are going to be taken by the rookies. Okay, so now we have safety. Jenkins and Love starting, which we all pretty much knew. Avon Wallace, your third safety right now. Kobe Bryant is your fourth safety. It's official now, by the way. We're trying him at safety. And that's probably all that's going to make the team for now. I do think Jarek Reed will start the season on IR and eventually join up again as like a special teamer. Is it, um, but obviously that's going to come later in the year. And then you've got Marquise Blair and Ty Okada who have uphill battles to make the team. Uh, unlikely they do, especially with how deep they are at cornerback. So that's the defense. Now we just have special teams. And some of this stuff's really interesting, actually. Myers is the kicker. That's not interesting. We know that. Punters Dixon, Holders Dixon, we knew that. Long snappers Chris Stoll, we knew that. Punt returner and kick returner, this might be educational. So for punt returns, punt returns, these are the ones that shouldn't be changing that much this year. We go D. Eskridge, number one. They currently think that D. Eskridge is the top punt returner. D. Williams, number two, a guy who I don't know how he makes the team. He will. It will be a remarkable job by him if he makes this team. And then Aesop Winston Jr. in third place. So that's how they see things right now. Now, this isn't ideal because Eskridge, I don't think we want him to make the team as a receiver. And if he takes a roster spot just for special teams, that's not ideal. You would want the guy who makes the team as your return man to also be able to do something else for you. So they're not just taking up a roster spot for special teams. And there's nobody here who I think is likely to make the team for any reasons other than special teams. Now, kick returner, on the other hand, it's better. We have Shane Alt Jr., who I think will make the team, or at least could make the team as a receiver. Eskridge, number two, which, hey, I'm not going to discount that, right? If Eskridge can be our punt returner and kick returner, that, that's dual value. There's something there. And then D. Williams is your number three kick returner, so he's doing both. Still, though, I, I just don't know how he, we have room for him on this team. We'd have to get rid of a receiver that we really like, probably, to make room for him. Or we'd have to get rid of a cornerback that we really like to make room for him. Like, can we trade somebody like a Trey Brown before the season? I, I, I don't know how exactly that, they would make that work. But, um, yeah, that's your depth chart so far. That's what we got. It's pretty good. I mean, it most of it makes sense to me. I do find some of this stuff interesting. I find some of it head-scratching. But um, that is what we are currently sitting on going into the start of the preseason. So uh, thank you for watching. And once again, before I end the video, I want to say thank you once again to BetUS for sponsoring this video. Once again, if you'd like to sign up for BetUS, use the link in the description below. Check it out. See you guys later. Go Hawks.